This is part three of our four-part series on European rearmament. If you want to listen to Neil Melvin from Rusi or Alex Clarkson from King's College, simply follow the links in the description. Otherwise, if you don't mind picking up part way through, here is part three. Part three. Something old, something new, something borrowed, and some withdrew. Domestically, the game is all about quantity right now. It's all about rate production. It's all about finding slack in the system that they can use to produce more quantity. There was reporting that came out that there are some workshops in Siberia that don't produce new tank hulls, but there's now a contract to modernize 800 of the old T-62s. Those vehicles were retired. They never would have been brought back into active service were it not for this war. But now because there's capacity in this location and the Russians are looking at this factory saying, hey, we can't use this to produce T-90M. What can we produce there? Well, we can modernize T-62. Well, the contract goes out and that's what they decide to produce there. Perun is a well-renowned defense analyst with a focus on defense economics, industrial capacity, and the global arms market. Having worked in government and throughout private industry, he's produced some of the best economic analysis around the conflict in Ukraine and has become a respected authority online and throughout the industry. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. At the same time, what they're producing is also changing to meet what they're able to supply in terms of their supply chain. Wartime austerity versions of some of their hardware go out into service. Uh, so, for example, many of the most modern Russian tanks will have the, the Sosna U as their site. So, relatively good quality thermal imager, but it relies on components that they now have difficulty sourcing and producing. So, we're now seeing tanks of that version go out with older versions of the site that they can produce domestically so that they can maintain production. They can meet the requirement for quantity even in this sort of sanctions constrained environment. And the final thing that I don't think they ever would have done during peacetime is the purchases of foreign systems from Iran on a very, very large scale. We've seen those very, very publicly, and they're likely going to continue in scale. And that really is uh, an emergency wartime measure. Many of Russia's systems are higher capability than the things they bring in from Iran, but when you're quantity limited, you look for whatever source you can find, and Iran has proven to be one of the sources the Russians can turn to. So whilst a lot of this piece has stemmed around the future purchases of tanks and equipment, the Russians are actually looking at some of their older purchases. In particular, the gargantuan amount of Cold War era tanks they currently have lying in storage. From multiple reports, we have seen that Moscow is beginning to pull some of these tanks out of storage, hoping to refit and deploy into the battlefield. But how successful do you think this refitting program will be? And whilst we're on it, is refitting and putting into the battlefield an option that would be available for the Western nations as well? Look, I'll include the caveat up front that it's hard to tell exactly how well the Russians are doing. Like, it's a bit of a black box. It's clear that it's happening on a large scale, and I'd say it's been vital to their staying power so far based on what we can see. As early as September last year, something like 600 to 700 tanks had disappeared from Russia's storage depots. Now, that doesn't mean they're all necessarily in service. They might be being dragged off to be modernized or cannibalized for parts, but they are disappearing. At the same time, we're seeing more and more of this old hardware that wasn't in large-scale service before February 2022, now appearing in service. I think as soon as April last year, we were seeing Russian propaganda footage showing some quite old towed artillery that shouldn't have been in service in large numbers, but they were choosing to show it off. So as these casualties and losses of equipment mount, that pool of reserved equipment is one of the first things the Russians can turn to. The question is, what is the quality and quantity there? How much can go into service with a little bit of work? How much is going to need to go into a factory rebuild, the way those T-62s are going to go through factory rebuild and upgrading? How much of it is only good to be cannibalized for parts and how much doesn't exist at all? Because there's some really, really high estimates of uh, Russian reserve hardware out there, you know, 12,000 reserve tanks or whatever. You look at the satellite footage and most of, a significant portion of that appears to just not exist at all or be in such a terrible state that you can assess even visually that you'll never be able to restore that vehicle into service. But absolutely vital. And it's not just the tanks. It's the artillery systems. It's the infantry fighting vehicles. We're seeing more and more BMP-1 appear on the Russian side because they've got more of them in reserve than they do for BMP-2. In terms of what Western powers can do in terms of reserved equipment, there's already some of that happening. Western European nations don't have the same deep reserves the Russians did in terms of there are no fields and fields of thousands of armoured vehicles in the equivalent of the Siberian waste to be brought back into service. But the, the recent announcement of the, the Leopard 1A5s, so 100 plus of those coming into Ukraine 
multinational coalition. Those tanks were not in service, they were in storage. They'll be restored and they'll be sent to Ukraine. If in the future Spain decides to spend more, send more Leopard 2s than they've currently announced, those will have to be restored from stock that is not currently in service. So there is some supply of this out there. And what about the Americans? The Americans have an awful lot of hardware in storage. Not as much on paper as the Russians, but several thousand Bradleys, thousands upon thousands of Abrams. I think it's 800 and something uh, M109 A6 Paladins. So the Americans do have a lot significant amount of hardware in reserve. There are barriers to getting that hardware reactivated and deployed to Ukraine, but the option is there if the time, the money and the political will is available to start reactivating and shipping some of that equipment. But the Americans are a bit of a unique case in that regard. It's hard to believe that it's been almost a year since Russia's February push into the rest of Ukraine. And I'm sure, as you would remember, those first few weeks were very touch and go for the Ukrainians. And for the West, it was absolutely crucial to get Ukraine everything they needed to fight off those first big thrusts by Russia into the country. And without a doubt, those first few weeks of March and April were chaotic. I still remember footage coming out around that period of men walking about in plain clothes, holding US anti-tank Javelin missiles, with only a coloured armband to identify them. Most of what we sent Ukraine during this very early period were stockpiles Europe just had lying about anyway, kept in storage in case of a Russian invasion of Europe. But with most of those stockpiles now burnt through, what are we sending Ukraine now? When the invasion happens, there's a, there's a phase of panic. What can we supply right this second that will make a difference? And what the Ukrainians are asking for is something that can stop the tanks and preferably also uh, defend against helicopters and air threats. So what can you send that you can train on in an afternoon to give your you know, bloke with an armband a chance against a tank? Well, you send as many shoulder-fired ATGMs or man pads as possible. So Javelin, Enlaw, those are the systems that get famous. But also all the old Warsaw Pact states and the Germans also dig up everything they can find from that era that can be fired from the shoulder, they send that. What changes over time is the equipment gets heavier and the origination of that equipment changes too. So the next real phase was when we started seeing heavy Warsaw Pact equipment start to go. The Poles in particular and the Czechs, they wasted no time. They started getting old T-72 model tanks moving across that border. I think in April last year is the first time we had visually confirmed tanks from Poland and SPGs and IFEs start to move over. But there's only so much of that to go around. Europe has a, has a finite supply of old Warsaw Pact equipment because they've been transitioning over to NATO equipment. So we've seen this transition where we start to supply Ukraine more and more NATO standard kit. First with the artillery systems, now also ground-based air defenses, very high profile announcement around the main battle tanks, but probably the most impactful is introducing Western artillery so that we can supply 155 mil or we can supply Gimlas for HIMARS, systems that we have more reserve of than 152 Soviet, for example. There just aren't the massive bunkers in Europe to supply that sort of uh, ammunition forever. And then more and more complex equipment as time goes on. So ground-based air defences, battle tanks, things that need more training, more time before introduction, more logistical back end. But eventually the Ukrainians are going to need because there's a finite supply of Warsaw Pact kit. In terms of how sustainable that is, it really depends on the system category that you're talking about. Some things, for example, would be very, very sustainable. You've seen some air defense systems that we've sent can fire AIM-120, AIM-9. These are Western standard air-to-air -air missiles. Those are available in very large numbers. Chance of that being exhausted, very, very low. And then there's systems that are in just very limited supply. Um, and as a result, you've seen that sort of supply rate decline. Javelin is not going to Ukraine in the same numbers it did in those early days. Because it was so quick to move, it was so quick to move the storages over and the production line is what it is you're not seeing them shipped at the same rate now. But the Ukrainians might say that's okay because we're getting more and more heavier equipment. So we're watching not just Ukraine, but many European nations using this war to clean out their closets of old equipment and instead replace it with brand new items. But undergoing that overhauling of your army is usually easier said than done. And not everyone is as keen to pay out the large amount of capital, and some countries may see more benefit in having five older Russian-style tanks as opposed to one brand new German-style tank. So can you take us through some of the challenges a Germany, a Poland, and a Bulgaria would have undertaking a large-scale refit of their armed forces? So it's requirements and resources. Poland is very, very clear on what its requirements are. 
it perceives a real conventional security threat, and as a result, it wants a capable, relatively large army that is configured to provide conventional deterrence against potential Russian aggression. They see that as requiring a transition over to Western equipment, both for the reasons of interoperability with the West, but also because they want to obtain a qualitative advantage. It's not an easy process. And what countries that have had to make the transition often do, as we've seen in Poland's case, is you seek a technology transfer partner, someone who is already producing a bit of equipment and you import some of it and then you move to producing versions domestically with more and more local components. You train up your local workforce until eventually you can produce and maintain it all domestically. Poland is entirely capable of producing something like PT-91. They can produce things in the Warsaw Pact family and they've been steadily moving their way towards being able to produce systems that are entirely Western in nature and now they arguably can in some categories. Germany absorbed the East German forces, but they weren't going to commit to using those designs long run. They were happy to run down that military capital, so to speak. This is a gross oversimplification, but they were happy to use some of that equipment for a while. But if you look at the, the future of the Bundeswehr, there's no Warsaw Pact heritage in the equipment that they're going to be using in the long run. Their industrial base is key to produce Western type equipment. They're a major exporter in that field. So there's every reason to keep producing that equipment and also to keep iterating it so that you're active on the export market. Bulgaria's problem, I suspect, is just resources. This is an expensive process. You would need to bring in new machine tooling. You need to find the international partner. You need to pay licensing. You need to train up a new workforce. And then somehow you need to be cost competitive on the international market or you need domestic orders that are big enough to sustain that industry. Polish defense industry can do a great job selling to the Polish government during its military modernization process and maybe selling it to the rest of Europe. I think Bulgaria trying to become a leader in selling NATO standard systems into NATO is a little bit more of an ask. And production is something that takes time as well. I think a classic example is in the recent announcement that Germany will be sending more Leopard tanks into Ukraine and the announcement of a 100 billion euro defense revamp. So how long do you think it will take for these tanks to hit the Ukrainian battlefield and for this 100 billion euro fund to start really shaping the German army? There will be a tail end for some of these decisions, depending on the systems that stretches out towards, what, the end of the 2020s, the early 2030s, before everything that's being talked about now has been funded. Because not everything's going to be funded from the, the 100 billion euro special fund. That's going to answer some of the immediate requirements. So, for example, they'll get their F-35s. But there will be ongoing transformational requirements for the Bundeswehr that stretch out for years that haven't even been budgeted for yet, let alone contracted. They may not even have the full a requirement locked down and negotiated. So it's a long transformation process. That's a far longer process than just moving a bit of equipment from Germany into Ukraine. That's a question of how quickly can we train up the crews? How quickly can we put logistics in place? Uh, can we be sure they're not going to break down a kilometer from Russian lines and get dragged off and we have a propaganda problem as well as a military problem because the equipment hasn't been sustained properly. But in terms of transforming a military, that can take a very, very long time, particularly in the naval sector. Armies tend to transform a little bit faster than navies do just because shipbuilding plans tend to be so long and you need to plan, in some cases, decades in advance for roughly the fleet size that you want and what sort of capabilities you need in your shipyards, for example. So if the answer is, when is the Bundeswehr going to be new? Well, how long is a piece of string? The transformation process will be continuous, but how far it goes and how quickly it moves is going to depend on the decisions the government makes in terms of funding and priorities. The battering the Russian army is taking in Ukraine is surely going to force Russian defence planners to make some serious doctrinal adjustments in the future. And I want to play that out a bit. So as a bit of a hypothetical here, let's say that Russia and Ukraine throw out their spring offensives and neither is successful. And the war solidifies into pretty solid battle lines, ending in a Transnistria or 2021 Donbass style situation. There are front lines, the two are still at war, and the occasional shell will get thrown, but the front mostly goes quiet with neither side having the strength to really break the other. At that point, with Moscow having a little bit of breathing room to start doing post-mortems, what ideas do you think Russian defense plan is going forward would prescribe to? The issue that Russia faces in that sort of long war scenario, and I often see the narrative that, hey, time favors the Russians, the Russians would be super happy with a frozen conflict. There may be political reasons to make that judgment, because maybe a frozen conflict is less threatening than outright defeat or concession, for example. But from a military perspective, you're looking, you're talking about a scenario in which Russia is economically in relatively dire straits compared to where it would be in a no-conflict scenario. 
So even if the economy is not massively shrinking year on year, there's a lot of pressure on the budget. There's a lot of reconstruction work to do in the areas that they occupy. And a lot of equipment has been lost and needs to be replaced. So there's a lot of competition there for the Russian defense budget. And what I find hard to imagine is where they would find the allocation to completely rebuild the military rapidly from the ground up. And so you may see them keeping older equipment that they have restored in service as a stopgap while they try and do reconstruction one component at a time. What's interesting is we still see them making announcements suggesting they want to do further investments in the Navy, that they want to make further investments in strategic and nuclear capable weapon systems. To me, that strikes me as a luxury they might not be able to afford in a frozen conflict scenario, because you have to imagine there's always a risk of fighting breaking out again. There's always a risk of skirmishing. And as a result, Russia's conventional military will have to be prioritized. So I don't know how rapidly they would be able to do a rebuild in that scenario. As we've said, it's a matter of resources, and resources will be tight and in very high demand in a post-war but frozen conflict scenario, I would think. In that same frozen Ukraine scenario, what are the Europeans doing going forward? Are we filling up Estonia with every tank we have, or are we building up stockpiles that can be sent quickly in case Russia tries again in somewhere like Ukraine or Moldova or Georgia? Bearing in mind, there's been a lot of rhetoric, but different countries are at different points in the spectrum of moving from rhetoric to budgeting to procurement to fielding. Different countries are at different levels along that, that line of progress with Poland moving about as fast as it is possible to move and others being a little slower. It seems to be that there are some countries, particularly those that would find themselves on the border, so Poland again is a good example, but it's not the only one, that are putting a lot of emphasis on having a military that is capable of either deterring some sort of conventional aggression or exercising influence in their border areas. Poland seems to be building towards a military which is capable of preventing any conventional fight pushing into the interior of Poland itself, even in the scenario that the Russians come through Belarus or Ukraine or anything like that. But I do think in general, there is some consensus around the idea of contributing to NATO high readiness task forces, which presumably would be pointed east as the primary threat basis. So you see some reinvigoration of conventional arms across the European continent, albeit to different degrees. As for the ability to supply Ukraine, I would be shocked if in a frozen war scenario there isn't some consideration given to what is the resupply plan in the event that the conflict goes hot again. That would strike me as a pretty logical requirement and something that would inform procurement planning. Stoltenberg's commentary recently that more should have been done for Ukraine before Russia invaded, I think that's pertinent and would, you could arguably interpret that as saying, well, if we were in the same situation again in the future, we wouldn't make that same mistake. We would make sure that the training, the logistics was in place. So in the event that we needed to move a bunch of platforms into Ukraine quickly, the capability was there. And what about the US? In this same scenario, do you think Washington will be building up its position in Europe again like they did during the Cold War? Or once Ukraine cools down, Washington will handball this theater back to the Europeans and Europe will once again become a bit of a sideshow to the US? I'll take a view based on the interpretation of what America has chosen to send and how it's interacted with the conflict so far, which is to say that America is clearly very focused on maintaining readiness for other scenarios. Those scenarios are presumably in the Pacific. So the rhetoric around we can't supply certain systems because it would impact our readiness for other contingencies, that shows that they regard being prepared for a Pacific contingency as sufficiently important that it might throttle their supply to the European theatre. So I don't think that there is any sign so far of a massive American rebalance towards Europe. Um, there will obviously be, and there obviously has been a change in the forward deployment of American troops in Europe. There will probably be more planning around stockpiling and war reserves. Those will probably be rebuilt if there's any opportunity to rebuild them. And some resources have deployed from stockpiles in Asia. So the movement of ammunition from South Korea to Europe, for example, but I don't think we're moving back to the middle late Cold War. And I think America's eyes in strategic terms are still very much locked on the Pacific. To the extent that they're intervening quite decisively in Ukraine, I think that's driven by Pacific interests as well. That America sees what happens in Ukraine as critical to providing deterrence and messaging in the Pacific about how America could respond to potential acts of aggression by other powers. In the early stages of February 2022, it was obvious what needed to be done. 
The European nations need to take all of the Warsaw Pact shells, guns, and ammunition that you've been keeping safe in your bunker for years in case of a Russian invasion and give it all to Ukraine. After all, if Russia wasn't blunted here, it would surely mean Ukraine today, Moldova tomorrow, and who knows after that. But now, in 2023, those bunkers are empty, and the Ukrainians are burning through more ammunition than you can produce, leaving the Western powers with only a few options. Should they invest billions into starting up more factories that make Warsaw Pact equipment, allowing Europe to continue to funnel shells to the Ukrainians, but would require millions of dollars of investment and have little use after the war in Ukraine? The other option is to move Ukraine to the NATO standard, but that would mean having to retrain the Ukrainians on all new gear. So far, the Ukrainians have adapted to it incredibly well, but there's more complicated gear still to come. And thanks to there being no NATO standard within Europe and the complicated patchwork of defense industry systems, you might have to train them on Polish gear and German gear and French gear and British gear as each nation begins to donate bits and bobs. Donating Ukraine gear to NATO also means special ordering in order to donate to Ukraine, rather than before, which was just the equipment sitting in crates getting old anyway. But even with all this in mind, you know that every time a Ukrainian shoots your $200,000 anti-tank rocket, more than the majority of the time, it knocks out a $4 million Russian tank. And economically, that's a bargain to knock out a tank today that could be used to threaten you in a few years' time. So, what should the Europeans do? Rebuild some of the old Warsaw Pact armaments to maintain the ability to supply Ukraine today and possibly supply Georgia or other countries tomorrow? Or bite the bullet, get further invested in Ukraine, and make sure Ukraine operates with the same equipment that NATO's best do. Well, to answer that, we turn to our final guest. This was part three of a four-part series on European rearmament. If you want to keep listening as we sit down with the Iran Corporation's Director for Defense and Security Research Group and examine the future defense priorities and pitfalls for Europe, simply click the box that just popped up or follow the links in the description.